More than 1.5 billion people worldwide are currently affected by hearing loss. I tell people my ears don't do anything. I don't really think they get what that means. They're like, oh, you can't hear. But I'm like, no, literally, my ears, there's, they have to serve no function. Anything that has a function can also have a dysfunction, especially when it's complex. Making sense of sound is one of the hardest jobs we ask our brain to do. There's a difference between hearing and auditory processing. Hearing is when your ears collect the sound. Auditory processing is what your brain does to make meaning from that sound. There is the idea that hearing happens in the ear, and of course, ears can be important, uh, but most of our hearing really happens in our brain. Your ears know nothing. It is all happening in your brain. Nice. Can you believe it takes a person seven years from when they first experience hearing loss to actually doing something about it? <laughs> As an audiology profession, we measure our success on help rate, how many hearing aids we sell, not actually how many people we can help. You think that's funny? As audiologists, we limit our patient's potential by relying on hearing tests that only show a small part of a bigger picture. How fucked is that? We judge people based on their communication without even realizing it. If someone mishears what you say, you might assume that they aren't paying attention, they're rude, maybe they're not intelligent, when actually this person may have a hearing problem. We know that elite athletes have excessively quiet brains. And we also know that children who live in poverty have excessively noisy brains. Think of it as static. It's this background neural activity that is always on. Matt's brain looks like an elite athlete's brain in that it is uncommonly quiet. Total silence, deafness, is entirely different than bad hearing. It's weird because your life didn't change. You know, it's not like all of a sudden your legs don't move or something, you know, just, you can't hear anything. It got lonely fast. My unhappiness or want for more came from me wanting to get back to where I was before. I have a lot of respect for the deaf culture. It's just not my culture. I can't go to work. I can't call work to tell them I'm not coming to work. Um, so you open up an email and you're like, what do I write? Can't come to work today, I'm deaf. You know, and then what's next? You know, because I'm deaf tomorrow too, and the next day, and the next day. And where do you start? My wife's name is Nora, and I had her with me, and uh, I had mom and dad that love me. I have friends that support me. Uh, I had a job, I, I mean, I had everything that you could possibly want. And I felt very, very alone cause, because you're just very quickly isolated from all of the stuff that you know. So he found out that he has a really severe rare disease diagnosis at the same time that he was likely going to be losing all of his hearing. And Matt loves music. He is all about it. And so he compiled a list of 66 of his favorite songs because Matt said, if I'm not gonna hear any sound the rest of my life, I want my favorite 66 songs on repeat inside my head. And so what did he do? He listened to them on repeat while he still had hearing sensitivity. 
because my damage was to the nerve. I had, oh, well, my hearing, my ears actually worked totally fine. It's the nerve at the end. So if you think like if this perfectly paved like highway is my hearing process, but there's a tiny little bridge out at the end of that highway and my bridge is out. My nerve is damaged in that tumor. And the doctor said, there is one other thing we can try, and it's called an auditory brainstem implant. The multi-channel auditory brainstem implant is a surgically implanted neuroprosthetic device developed to electrically stimulate the auditory neurons of the cochlear nucleus complex by bypassing the auditory nerve. It is used to restore hearing sensation in patients for whom a cochlear implant is not effective and or applicable. When he hears sound, it shocks his brain like this. If a normal hearing range is equivalent to a full set of crayons, and a profound hearing loss or deafness is no crayons, an ABI may provide a few imperfect crayons. And I woke up and the surgery was a success because I lived. And you know, your priorities change a little bit during invasive brain surgery of like, hooray, I'm alive. <laughs> And so that was the first box that we wanted to check. Um, the second box was we got all of the tumor out. Um, the third was we implanted the ABI and it looks like, you know, it was successful, but we won't know if it works for another 12 weeks because before we turn it on, we need to just let me heal and have swelling go down. The fourth thing and the unexpected difficulty of that was uh, right next to your hearing nerve is your facial nerve and the tumor was wrapped around my facial nerve as well, so they had to sever that nerve. So I woke up without hearing and without the ability to move or feel half my face. Emotionally, that was hard for me because it took away my smile. I was able to navigate some really tough stuff by just putting on a smile and finding the humor in something. I took this stuff and I dealt with that fine by smiling through it or finding a way to laugh about it. But then it took my smile. And that was one of probably one or two like really low moments for me of like, you did this thing to me and you took away my coping mechanism for that thing. So I needed to get that or tried to get that coping mechanism back. I was fortunate that when they did turn the ABI on it worked, but everything sounded like a bottle cap and a garbage disposal. We would never fit a prosthetic limb on someone and then give them an app to teach them how to walk again. That's BS. I went to work on, you know, initially I'm going to use, I'm going to wear this all the time. I'm going to wear my implant all the time and I'm going to, by osmosis, just start picking up sounds in the world around me. So I started playing those songs that I listened to right before my hearing loss um, and the songs that were really ingrained and had these wonderful memories associated with him and selfishly I wanted to hear those songs again so let's start with my favorites which is a lot of like Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel, Prince, Elton John. So I started listening to a lot of those same songs over and over again with very little success but years later I started getting bits and pieces here. It was really the kind of a conversation between my implant and my brain saying, hey, ABI, you're hearing it this way, but that chord I remember, and it's supposed to sound, that progression sounds like this, bum, bum, bum. And by doing that, he was able to force a correlation between what he's hearing now to what he used to hear. The hearing brain engaging our cognitive, sensory, motor, and reward systems. Music does that really better than anything I can think of. He unknowingly created his own method to treat himself once his auditory brainstem implant was switched on. When they first turned in my implant on and they said, hey, you're, at best you're gonna hear life noises, 25%, maybe at best speech recognition, which is helpful because you can hear shoes on the floor, um, you know, police sirens, 25% speech recognition is remarkably different than none. Um, everybody said that's where you're gonna be. And I believed him, um, shame on me. Then when my kids were born, not being able to distinguish between which one was crying or not being, if, if one of your kids says, dad help, 
and you don't know who that is and because sound's only coming in on one side, I didn't know where that was coming from. It's a helpless feeling. I mean, it made me feel like less of a dad, less of a husband, less of just a person. And uh, I thought, well, I have to do something about this. So I found a new job that was wonderful. And through that job, trying to figure out how to sell a, a device in hearing care. And I first started hearing about auditory processing. I only heard about that because I tried to sell our device to somebody working in auditory processing. APD stands for Auditory Processing Disorder. Auditory processing is what the brain does with what we hear. And auditory processing disorder is when it doesn't go well. People with APD can have normal hearing but still struggle with listening and understanding. Symptoms can vary widely from person to person. and can affect people of all ages. One treatment for APD is auditory training, which is like coaching for your brain. I would like to gather some data and see if there are ways that I see that your processing could get some help. And I want to work with you a bit. Do I know what I'm going to see? Absolutely not. <laughs> and we started this saying, I don't think this is going to make any difference because I'm already doing very well with my implant. I'm on year 16 with this thing. I probably reached even beyond the ceiling of expectations. Have you noticed anything different with your auditory processing over the past two weeks? I would love to say yes, but I have not. Have you yes. experienced anything in the last week or so um, that might indicate a change in your processing? Nothing has jumped out specifically. Now, have you noticed any changes in your processing abilities in the last week or so? I haven't had a moment where I thought specifically my auditory processing differs right there. Nothing has jumped out Specifically, uh, I have not noticed anything specific. What we have been taught to do as audiologists is to counsel the client to have realistic expectations. So basically, just know it's going to be crap. I would like to see hearing health be handled very much like a personal trainer. You know, this is something that we have really lost in medicine. When we look at a hearing test, that doesn't tell us anything about that person. We need to be able to look at each person not as an interchangeable patient or object or professor, but as an individual who has a history, has certain needs, has certain desires. They refer to patients as subjects. Sometime when I'm not here, you're talking about me as a subject. I don't want to be a subject. And I know a lot of really wonderful people dealing with the same thing I am, and I don't want them to ever be considered a subject. <laughs> yeah, they're moms and dads and brothers and sisters. Here's the next sound. N, N. Like not next nincompoop. Wow. N. Yeah, all right. I don't know if it's an electrode or what, but this is a sound that does not sound to me naturally. Cool. Um, it, it sounds to me like you're saying, I, 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 why, why? Auditory training works. Auditory training is absolutely fundamental to how people learn to hear the sounds of their lives. You find a coach that you feel like can push you in the right ways, that you can connect with, and um, because that's how you're willing to come back and do it the next week. I benefited a lot from having that formal training. I mean, I don't really know how I could have possibly gotten the outcome if I had not had that. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> um, mm. 
N. 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 Exactly right. Exactly right. When I met Matt, he was understanding between 64 and 67% of words in quiet, which is absolutely unknown for most people with an auditory brainstem implant. So I felt guilty having to say each, at the beginning of each session, no, I didn't hear anything new. Uh, one morning driving in for a session, um, my playlist of 12 songs I like was now up to about 60 songs. Let It Be came on and the line came, uh, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, which is not a big deal to hear that unless for the last 20 years of your life, you have been hearing that and seeing that as Mother Mary comforts me. But I heard Mother Mary comes to me. And I remember thinking, I've, I haven't heard that T before. Well, by coincidence, the week before we had been working on T, T. I've been hearing that one way for a really long time. And so I, when this time she asked, what, what did you notice know difference? And I said, well, actually, <laughs> um, there's a line in a Beatles song and I had not done anything different. So um, I don't know what else to have attributed that to. Ah. Ah. B. B. Mmm. Mmm. Eh. Eh. D. D. N. N. That is amazing! After doing 12 one-hour sessions once a week for three months, he was able to recognize between 87 and 92% of speech in quiet. Quit just trying to get better by existing uh, and start to really be intentional in the way that you practice these things. We very often don't see the same doctor again and again, year after year, and yet that's the very best way in which diagnostic decisions are made. Audiology actually is one of the few fields where it's still possible to have the same patient year after year. That's something to cherish. With so many different comorbidities that have some crossover with auditory processing, we have the potential for auditory training to completely change our healthcare landscape. If Matt Hay can successfully rewire his brain to make sense of sound, my profession has the ability to change their minds. I think we all have a remarkable story to tell. The hard part isn't doing the remarkable thing, it's identifying and looking back and recognizing what you did that was unique or special or impactful.